you are given the functional, for instance, one that is associated with an object falling down. You now want to optimize this functional. For this, you take the functional derivative, set it to zero. You know how to evaluate it by the Gateau variation, but this is tedious. Is there a simpler way? And indeed there is. In this video, we will derive the Euler-Lagrange equation. Hi, welcome to this new video. Let us start with defining a more general functional. And for this, I will say that the functional of the function i is given as the integral from a to b over a function with a capital L that depends on t, y, and y prime, and is integrated over t. This function is called the Lagrangian, because in this case, we are talking about Lagrangian mechanics. But don't be confused. This has nothing to do with the Lagrangian in Lagrangian multipliers. It's just that Lagrange was a famous mathematician. And surely, of course, inside this Lagrangian, we have the dependency on t, which is the variable we are integrating over. Think, for instance, of time. And we have y and y prime. So we have the function itself and its first temporal derivative. And in our case, we looked at the following Lagrangian, which was given as y prime squared minus 4 times y, which was the Lagrangian associated with an object falling down with a certain mass and a certain acceleration due to gravity. We now want to derive a general condition that has to hold for L in order to minimize or in general optimize this functional. So we want to show that the functional derivative of i with respect to y has to equal to zero. And for this, we will apply the Gateau variation or the Gateau derivative, which is given as the substantial derivative with respect to a scalar epsilon of an augmented input to our functional. If this sounds strange to you, then please go back to my previous video where I derive this really intuitively and I hope then it kind of clear why we're doing this. But just as a quick reminder is the generalization of a directional derivative where we augment the function that our functional is taking by a little bit and then changing this little bit and evaluating epsilon to zero. And this has to hold to zero. Okay, let us do this step by step and we will first derive the functional with an augmented input. And for this, we keep the integral from a to b over t. And inside the Lagrangian, we have the dependency on t. Well, this does not change. But at each point where y resides, we augment it with y plus epsilon phi. So we get y plus epsilon phi here, and then comma y plus epsilon phi, but the temporal derivative of it. Okay, then let's evaluate the temporal derivative. And for this, let us recall that epsilon was just a scalar, and epsilon does not depend on t. And in this case, we just have the addition of two functions that depend on t, and the derivative is fairly straightforward. So we get, again, the integral over a to b over dt. And inside, we have the Lagrangian of t of y plus epsilon phi and y prime plus epsilon phi prime. Next step, we have to take the substantial derivative of i of y plus epsilon phi, what we just did the augmented input with respect to epsilon, and then we have the integral from a to b. And also let me note this down, this is the substantial derivative. So in other words, this means that we are digging. So in a sense, we have implicit dependencies and we want to dig down. It seems a little strange, let's just do it. And in this case, we first look at the first dependency of L, and this is with respect to t. And t does not depend on epsilon, so we don't have a derivative with respect to t in a sense. But then we go on. This is nothing else than our original y, and this is our original y prime. And our augmented y now depends on epsilon. So we first have to take the derivative of L with respect to y, and then we have to take the derivative of this expression with respect to epsilon. So we have dL by d epsilon, because this is the outer derivative, and now multiplied with the inner derivative of y plus epsilon phi with respect to epsilon, then plus, and the same story holds here, first derive with respect to y prime, and then with respect to the augmented y prime, so the derivative of L with respect to y prime, multiplied with the derivative of y prime plus epsilon phi with respect to epsilon, dt. Okay, then let's evaluate these derivatives here. So we are keeping the integral from a to b, and we have the derivative of L with respect to epsilon, or the partial derivative, multiplied with 
this, which will evaluate to just phi. And here we will have the derivative of L with respect to epsilon prime. And here we will just also get a phi prime, surely. And then the T. Okay, last step for our Gateau variation is to set the substantial derivative at epsilon to equal to zero. So we had the substantial derivative, this was this. And then we say epsilon is equal to zero. Well, we don't have any epsilon here anymore, so this does not change at all. So we just keep the integral from A to B over the Lagrangian with respect to Y times phi plus the Lagrangian with respect to Y prime times phi prime dt. And now we are encountering the same problem as we had in the video on functional derivatives in general, that we have a derivative on the phi and we want to get rid of it in order to apply the fundamental lemma of calculus of variations. So we do integration by parts. But before we get there, let me first split out the integrals into two parts. So we have the integral over the Lagrangian with respect to y times phi dt plus the integral from a to b over the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to y prime times phi prime dt. And we want to apply partial integration or integration by parts to the right sum and here. So what we will be getting is we keep the first integral, which is the integral from a to b over the Lagrangian with respect to y times phi dt plus, and then keep in mind, we want to integrate phi and we want to take the temporal derivative of this object here. So first we have the boundary term and for this we will get the Lagrangian with respect to y prime times phi evaluated at a and b minus the integral from a to b over the derivative with respect to t over the Lagrangian with respect to y prime and this is the substantial derivative that is important and we multiply this with phi dt because we have it like integrated here. Recall the boundary term, only the integration happens and then in the follow-up integral we have the integration and the temporal derivative. And then again we have the property of the phi functions, which was the test functions, that they vanish at the boundary. So say phi vanishes at boundary and with this we can ignore the boundary term and we are left with the two integrals and I will stitch them back together. So we have the integral from A to B over the Lagrangian with respect to Y. And surely there shouldn't be a Y prime here. Sorry for this. In brackets minus the derivative with respect to T of the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to Y prime. And then we have a phi dt. I hope this makes sense. I just stitched them together and put this into one big bracket. And then we have the fundamental lemma of calculus of variations. And this holds that if we multiply anything with a test function inside of an integral, and this has to hold to zero, which was our condition for minimization, optimization, stationarity, etc. however you want to call it, then we can just set this term outside of the integral to zero. So let's say we do the fundamental lemma of calculus of variations. And of course, the important factor is also here that it has to hold to zero. And then we get the following expression, which is the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to y minus the substantial derivative with respect to t over the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to y prime. And this has to hold to zero. And what we just found is the Euler-Lagrange equation. And since this is a little confusing, since we have so many types of derivatives here, let me just recall this. So a partial derivative is blind for implicit dependencies. This means that if our L depends on Y, we just take the partial derivative and don't care about any further dependencies. Whereas the substantial derivative that we have here is some sort of like digging and it's digging all the way down until it finds the last dependency on T. Let us again look at our example. And for the example, we had the Lagrangian, which was given as Y prime squared minus four times Y. And if we plug this into our Euler-Lagrange equation, then we get the derivative of our Lagrangian with respect to y is minus 4 minus and then the derivative with respect to t or substantial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to y prime. And this will just be 2 times y prime has to hold to 0. And if we apply another temporal derivative to y prime, then we of course get y double prime and we have minus 4 minus 2 y double prime equals zero. 
and then we can rearrange this and we get y double prime equals minus two. And if we recall, this was also the equation that we arrived at the end of the last video on the functional derivatives and it's associated with Newtonian mechanics. In essence, what we have here is the f equals m times a and we see that we can recover this from the Lagrangian mechanics. But there is also one more important aspect. So let's call this one more thing. If we have a special type of Lagrangian, and for this let us consider the Lagrangian, which is L of T and Y instead of L of T, Y and Y prime, for which we derived the Euler-Lagrange equation, then if we want to do the functional derivative of our functional with respect to y and want to set it to zero, then in this case, this leads to the Euler-Lagrange equation where we derive L with respect to y minus dt and then the L by dy prime, right, equals zero, but we don't have any dependency on y prime. And in this case, that is zero, for this scenario, we can then say that taking the functional derivative with respect to a function and setting it to zero is equal to taking whatever is inside of the integral and just derive it with respect to y in a partial derivative sense. So in this case, instead of functional derivative, we can do a classical partial derivative. But recall, this is only possible in the case we don't have any temporal derivatives of our function y inside of the functional. So if the Lagrangian does not depend on y prime or also any higher order derivatives, so y double prime, y triple prime, and so on. And you get the point, and that is really crucial because this really simplifies our life in certain derivations where we have to take the functional derivative of certain simple functionals. That marks the end of the video for the Euler-Lagrange equation. I hope you enjoyed it. If anything is unclear, then please leave a comment. I would be happy to answer this. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, I would really appreciate you liking and subscribing. Here you will now see similar videos and I'm hoping to see you next time.